Institute. And I think this person is really making a revolution in the education. At least he's asking very big questions about education. And I think it's not only to parents, but for all of us, for learners, it will be very interesting to listen to Bill Richardson. Dear Bill, hello, happy to see you. Well, Thanks so much for having me, appreciate it. Thank you. My first question to you, uh, you were mentioning that schools are not made for learning and it is actually very frightening. Schools are not made for learning. You know, you start feeling, are they made for prison? Are they made to make our kids just sit for a long period of time and not to be naughty? What, uh, what do you mean by that? Well, I think if we all take a look at how we learn and what we've learned most profoundly or most passionately that, um, you know, there are certain conditions that exist for our own learning. And those things are, we're not constrained by time when we do that. We're, we're not segregated out by age. Uh, we don't learn math for 45 minutes and then learn science for 45 minutes. Um, we're not tested all the time and, and you know, given uh, ranked by numbers or scores. I think a lot of the things that we do in schools, we do for efficiency, not for effectiveness, and especially when it comes to learning. So many of the conditions that we require as humans, uh, the natural kind of conditions for learning to happen, don't exist in schools. And if we, if we were to make those conditions happen in schools, it would make us much less efficient, right? Because learning is a messy thing. It's not something that's linear. It doesn't happen you know, by a, a lesson plan or a curriculum in most cases. So um, yeah, and, and I think most of us know this because if we think back to what we learned, quote unquote, in school, we probably forgot most of it within a, a short amount of time after we graduated and left. Very little of what we actually retained or, or, or what we actually um, you know, like discussed and were, were, uh, were given in school, very little of that is what we actually retain and use in our lives. So. Um, I think now that's a problem, right? Because most of us, or many of us at least, now have access to all of the information that there is in the world. We have access to many different teachers from anywhere in the world who share our passions and interests. And, and so we can identify those people who can help us learn what we want to learn, which is a condition for learning. It has to be something that we want to learn more about. That's how we learn the, the things that we learn most profoundly and deeply. So schools are at this kind of very interesting inflection point right now because they're competing um, in a world now that looks very different from the ones that we're creating inside of the classroom walls. And um, I think a lot of people are beginning to understand that the limitations of classrooms are not serving us in terms of helping us figure out the, the challenges that the future is going to bring us. And also, though, for uh, helping us understand the opportunities that we have to really learn on our own, to create with other people, to connect and collaborate, uh, and to do really great things in the world uh, on our own, right? So I think that's the, the interesting question right now. What, what is the role? What is the value of schools in a world where so much now is accessible to us, you know, by the things we carry in our back pockets? Uh, in one of the interviews, you were saying that if you will ask uh, 50,000 people or 5,000 people, what is ideal school for you? They will say creativity, freedom, be uh, able to connect, be able to walk, be able to move, be able to use. And in fact, right. you should sit for six hours. You should sit at the desk. You shouldn't move. If you will ask stupid question, maybe you will be punished for being naughty and for interrupting the class and the teacher. So actually, uh, it's on the contrary. So what do you think, how we can cover that uh, gap? Well, yeah, so I mean, I think if you, if you told people that they could start all over, they could start from scratch and build school whatever way they want to, I don't think many people would build what we have right now. I don't know if anyone would build exactly what we have right now. Um, because again, it, it doesn't serve that purpose that we want, which is to help kids become really deep and powerful learners in the world. That's what they have to be right now. Um, they, you know, they have to, certainly they have to have some subject area knowledge. They have to be able to read and write and communicate really fluently. 
Um, they have to be do, able to do enough math to get them through the world. I mean, all kids certainly need certain amounts of content knowledge and skills. Um, but but basically beyond that, beyond some of those core things, I think it's it's all about how do we develop kids as learners. So um, again, it comes back to what kind of conditions do you create around that? Um, most of what we have in schools doesn't really support that. Uh, but this is a difficult conversation to have. In fact, a lot of people would argue that maybe it's not even possible to change schools that have already existed, that are, you know, been around for 50 years or 100 years or even 20 years. Maybe it's not even possible to move them to a place where they're doing things very, very differently from what they're used to doing and what they're expected to of do. Of course, because, because uh, Will, there is so much money involved. Can you imagine? Well, you ask, sure. uh, you, yeah, you, uh, you question the whole education system, which right. is like medical yep. system. It's like millions uh, that expecting that parents will be uh, paying for. The, imagine if you tell them, guys, schools are no needed anymore. Or maybe please look at the Finnish system where kids are outside right. and they're studying uh, right. nature. Yeah. Mm, so I don't, what then I don't happens? think it's. I don't think it's that schools aren't needed any longer. I think schools can be amazing places for kids to learn. And I think that there's something extremely valuable about bringing kids together with adults who can mentor them and nurture them and really um, kind of push them to greater heights than they can get to on their own, right? So I think schools and communities play can play a very, very important role. Um, but that would require some rethinking. Um, it would require um, kind of putting aside a lot of the stories and narratives that we have around what school is, right? Because we're all products, not all of us, but most of us are products of that school experience. And so when we look at our own children, we say, well, yeah, that's what I want for my kids because it's, it's uh, you know, I, I understand it. Um, I, I know what it what it's like. Um, so, I, I mean, schools are can be great places uh, for for teachers and for kids to learn. Unfortunately, that's not what schools are, are about so much right now, though. And and so it's not getting rid of schools. That's not what the conversation is. It's how do we change them into places that really prepare kids to thrive in this moment? And I think we all agree this is kind of an interesting moment that we're in the middle of right now. And it's it portends a very uncertain future that the traditional way we think about schools simply is not preparing our kids for. It's just not. Schools are highly predictable. And kids just want to know, what do I need to learn? When do I need to learn it? How do I need to learn it? How can I pass the test? And then how do I get to the next thing? That's not the way the world works any longer. Um, nothing is predictable any longer. And so we have to be more agile. We have to be more flexible. And we have to help our kids be more flexible in terms of problem solving asking really interesting questions that they want to pursue and, and creating things that live in the world and change the world in good ways. Um, it's not just about getting a credential, passing a test and going to university and, you know, getting a job any longer. Uh, you know, uh, I uh, watch one of your interviews where uh, I think you were talking about your son and about chemistry test. And you said that uh, he uh, studied everything and he received, uh, received 10 out of 10. And th then you said that you wonder maybe after one week or two weeks or three weeks, because it's just a test, you just need to tick, 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 tick. So it's very right. easy to do tick, tick, tick. But maybe after three weeks, you know nothing because you just know how to give tests. But if you don't have these answers next to you, maybe you will know at the end right. of the day is almost zero. And this is yeah. like terrible right. because, you know, your grades are A, but you know nothing. But, it, but it's true. And I think three weeks is actually optimistic. I think he probably <laughs> forgot most of that stuff the day after the test was over because he knew he was never going to use it in his life. He knew that it had no relevance to what, um, you know, what he was doing. He didn't have any real interest in the subject because it was just a course, a curriculum that he knew he had to get through. But I don't think it's just my son. I think, I, I don't know, I would ask you, um, isn't that kind of how you experience school as well? It certainly is the way I experience school. Um, and I think most of us know this in our heart of hearts. Most of what we learn in school, we quickly forget because as soon as the test is over, there's no real reason to know it. And, and you know, schools are built on the premise that if you need, let's say, the Pythagorean theorem at some point in your life, 
Well, let's keep our fingers crossed that you can remember it when you're 35 years old and you're building a boat or something, right? It's 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 just in case learning. That's what it is. It's just in case you need this someday. We're going to teach it to you when you're 13 years old in March of your June, you know, of your eighth grade year, whatever it is, instead of just in time learning, which is all about how do we help you develop as a learner so that when you're confronted with a problem or a question, you know how to go about solving that or answering that by finding really good information that you're able to vet and edit and make sure that it's accurate and truthful, by finding other people in the world who are experts, who can, who can in, you know, teach you or coach you through that, and then by understanding what tools and technologies are available to you to build things or to, to create solutions to those particular questions that you have. That's not what we're helping kids do. We're helping them pass tests. And then that's not going to serve them moving forward into the future. You know, I I'm so agree with you because, you know, I think this is exactly what I'm doing. And uh, of course, uh, as you say, it's so uncertain. So we should be agile. Nobody knows what will be tomorrow. So, of course, there should be some changes. For example, I remember one teacher till now uh, that was the teacher of geography in school. And he said the most important when you study something about the country, you try to know what you can do yourself. Find what is the population, what the country is famous for what is the economy is based on do research yourself and then please make presentation i give you right. 20 minutes to prepare try to do it yourself study and i was surprised how everybody did amazing presentations because all the kids were so interested to research and then to present somebody presented france somebody presented brazil it was completely different things till now i remember that but all other things i forgot <laughs> that means asking the questions. It right. was actually the right thing because he said, ask right. the questions and also cooperate in the groups, in the groups, right. like groups of five people. Maybe that is what we should uh, uh, make kids do in the schools. Well, look, everyone who's listening to this right now, if they have a question or a problem to solve, they're not waiting for a course. They're not waiting for someone to do a workshop on it. They're going to YouTube. They're putting in a search. How do I fix this? How do I create this? Or they're, they're doing searches on Google. They're going online, most of them, if not all of them. And they're, they're trying to figure out the answers on their own. Um, you know, if we're teaching kids to wait for someone to, to tell them or to, to teach them how to, you know, how to do something or, or um, you know, what, what, how, to, how to use a particular technology, then again, we're not setting them up for what success requires uh, right now. And we're not actually emulating our own learning. I mean, no one waits for that stuff any longer, uh, except in school. You know, if I want to, again, if I'm in eighth grade and I want to, or if I'm in sixth grade and I want to build a boat and I need to understand the Pythagorean theorem or something else in math to do that, I may have to wait until eighth grade before that comes up in the curriculum. Well, that's kind of ridiculous. I mean, so anyway, it's the world has appreciably changed right now. And it's not just because of the pandemic. And it's not just because of all the social unrest and racial unrest that's happening in the world. And it's not just because of looming climate change. And it's not, you know what I mean? It's like the world has changed because we are more connected. We are we have more access to more technologies in good and bad ways, by the way that allow us a much a much more agency and freedom to pursue learning on our own terms and that's a wonderful thing it's a great thing but it's not happening in schools it's not happening in those spaces so when kids get out of school and they go into the real world now and they start to learn on their own basically schools are just kind of crossing their fingers and saying well good luck with that we hope you're successful at that because we didn't really prepare you for that but at least when you were in eighth grade, you knew what the Pythagorean theorem was. So, you know, I mean, it just, it doesn't make a lot of sense right now. And so uh, we have to begin to really shift the way that we have these conversations about education and schooling, because the challenges that we're facing right now are acute and they're existential in a lot of ways. And it's scary in a lot of ways, but it's also really exciting in a lot of ways because we can do so much more. We can create so much more and we can learn so much more. So there's good and bad in this moment. Will, tell me, please, any school, did they take your advice? Did they um, took it seriously? Because what you're saying is very, very 
Right. And it is, uh, I'm surprised that you start researching this topic, as I noticed, 20 years ago. It's not that you wake up today and say, oh, guys, look, there is pandemic, right. something going wrong. No, you, you are doing it for such a long period of time, by the way. You're studying it. So did yeah. you implement some of your ideas into the schools or till now? Some. they're they, Like yeah, what? Some. Tell me, please. Yeah. Change is really hard. You know, it's very, very difficult. And and it's not just the systems change that has to happen, right? But it's it's a, a personal change that requires us as teachers. And I taught for 22 years, right? I was a high school teacher for 22 years. It requires us to, to, to redefine our value in a lot of ways, right? Because it used to be the teachers were the content experts. Um, and, you know, we were the ones who delivered the curriculum and we were the ones who taught. And now our value really is as a learning coach, more or less, to, to help kids, again, pursue their own questions, to figure out what technologies to use, to figure out how to, how to create solutions. So part of the change that has to happen is within us. And that's really hard because I was a damn good teacher, if you know what I mean, right? I was a really good teacher, and now you're asking maybe to be something different, and that's very difficult for people to do, and I totally understand that. So change is really hard, and it takes a really long time. Um, but in answer to your question, yeah, there are some schools that are changing, uh, definitely. Uh, they're becoming much more learner-centered, is a phrase that I think is kind of interesting. Um, they're giving kids much more agency and choice and real freedom around what they want to learn, how they want to learn it, and when they want to learn it, and what they want to do with that learning. Um, they're beginning to realize that, that our efforts to kind of push curriculum into kids' heads simply doesn't work, and that most of it, again, just kind of falls away um, very quickly after the course is over or, or the test is done. So, yeah, and, but the really interesting thing to me is now on the edges of education are all sorts of brand new schools that people are building that are, are embracing many of these ideas. And I have to say that uh, I think it's easier, it's not, it's not easy, but it's easier to do that. It's easier to build from the ground up around the types of values and the types of, of ways you think about learning than it is to take, a, again, a traditional school that's been around for a long time and say, now you have to shift, now you have to turn. That's very, very difficult to do. Um, so a lot of these people are saying, let's just start new. Let's just start fresh and build other things. And I do think that that's going to be kind of the arc of this conversation in the next decade or so. There's gonna be a lot more people building a lot of new different types of ways of thinking about school and that eventually, at some point, traditional schools then will have to begin to seriously consider changing um, in order just to stay current with the way that education and learning is happening um, at a larger scale. Will, you are a very progressive person, and I'm very happy that you are not afraid to talk about it because it's not that popular. You're going a little bit against, uh, you know, against the waves, you know, and uh, as a teacher who worked for 22 years, that is a very big sacrifice, especially you said that you were a very good teacher. That means, you know, you sacrifice comfort zone. What you will recommend to the parents who stuck with kids now and who happen to be teachers, who are not actually teachers, but who do on, or online learning and they don't know where to run, where to hide, in which bathroom or kitchen from these kids who are asking <laughs> questions on math or geography or I don't know. Right. And they really, they said their life changed completely. They, yeah. they are not people who were one year ago. How to, how you, how to survive that or what to do? Yeah, I wish I had a, a you know a magic wand or a, a one great piece of advice to help parents with that. It's extremely difficult in this moment, and there's no way around it. We happen to be living at what may be the most challenging moment in most of our lifetimes, um, and uh, it's going to get better, I think, but it'll never go back to normal. I, I think first the first thing we have to understand and we have to just wrap our brains around is that we're not going to go back to the way things used to be. And by the way, I, I argue that I don't think we want to go back to the way things used to be, to be honest with you. The, the way things used to be brought us to this point where we have a whole bunch of problems in the world right now that we have to that we have to figure out. So I think number one is just to try to embrace the idea that 
we're going to be in this, I call it a no normal period, not a new normal, but a no normal period for a while. And it's just going to be kind of, you know, waking up and, and, and wondering, OK, so what changed today? You know, um, some of that change is going to be really good, I think. Some of it is going to be, again, challenging. So that's number one. Number two, I, I think that we really have to focus on wellness right now. We have to make sure that we, we um, keep ourselves balanced and our kids as well. A lot of people now are talking about, you know, well, kids are so far behind. They've lost so much, you know, time in school. And now we should have all summer. We should just go all summer long and, you know, no more breaks. And, and that, I think that's the worst thing that we can do. I, I read something in The Guardian the other day that I thought was great. And a lot of people in, in the UK now are suggesting a summer of play that all we do this summer is just play. Um, and get outside and, you know, just just try to to re regain some of our our wellness, our mental wellness, you know, and our physical wellness, because this pandemic and this this quarantine has has caused us to suffer in lots of ways that we may not even realize, you know, physically and mentally, emotionally, spiritually, all that kind of stuff. And we need some time just to to, you know, um, to recapture that. I would say to parents to, you know, and, and again, this may sound somewhat privileged and maybe it is a little bit privileged, but I wouldn't worry so much about learning loss. Uh, I wouldn't worry so much about falling behind. Um, what I would really be concerned about is making sure that our kids are, are, are uh, joyful, that they are balanced, um, that they feel loved and cared for and nurtured, all those things. I think that's just the most important thing right now, because if they don't have those things, they're not going to learn anything anyway. Learning requires, you know, that, that we feel that we feel safe. Learning requires that we feel cared for um, and that we have hope. So um, I would focus all of my efforts on those areas, not worry so much about the school piece of it, and really let kids run on their own when it comes to what they want to learn, you know, um, let let them pursue things on their own terms. It sounds scary and kind of risky, but I think that that's a healthy thing for for both of both parents and kids to do learn together um, in those ways. I think, uh, you know, Will, that kids are a little bit ahead of us because they take this time much better. They are more open and really they are better in asking questions and they are better, as you say, go and play. This is wonderful saying, this summer go and play and yeah. just breathe and just let this balance yeah. come back to you. And when they will feel happy and parents will help, will feel happy. Even the parents will learn better because parents, they need to catch up with their offices. They also should become learners as the kids are. And this combination when kids can help parents and parents can help kids will be more powerful and will be more healthy. And that is, uh, that is wonderful what you're saying. And that is very, very important that you start uh, touching this topic 22 years ago and you, you know, you start thinking about long before and uh, I hope that you will be able to change the mind of many educators because it is very challenging time for educators as well. I can imagine if the teacher is working in school for 10 years, imagine what kind of uh, you know, stress for him as well, because everybody now accusing teachers. Teachers are not good, but who will yeah, take care of no teachers? Doubt. No doubt. <laughs> I think we also should take care about teachers as well, because they're also fragile. No doubt. Absolutely right. Yeah, that is wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us. It was very, very precious advices. And I think we should make uh, our kids to run and play more. And it will solve a lot of problems. They will feel more loved and better learners. Thank you so much, Will. It was a big pleasure. pleasure to be with you. Thanks Thank so much you. for having Thank me. Thank you so it. much. Good luck. Thank you.